Okay, so we're looking at a very interesting phenomenon. Let's take a random uh, triangle uh, represented by this blue triangle here. Okay, and I'm going to draw uh, a pencil of circles. Pencil of circles that I've selected. It doesn't matter what this pencil is, but I'm actually only drawing the left hand side of an elliptic pencil of circles. I'm going to draw the right hand side in a little bit. For those of you who are familiar with uh, inversive geometry, this is a very well-known object. Uh, it's basically the linear combination uh, of the implicit equation for two circles in the plane. Okay, so when you do this linear combination, you have a variant parameter lambda. Here's lambda. You can actually, it, lambda will sweep continuously a family of circles uh, known as a pencil, an elliptic pencil of circles in this case. Okay, there's a hyperbolic one, but uh, we're not going to get into too many details now. I'll refer you guys uh, in the description to some uh, simple um, links to, to the subject. Okay. Now, a pencil of circles is associated with a zero ra two ra zero radius circles, uh, which are known as limiting points. They are represented here as L1 and L2. And uh, going through the midpoint uh, of these two limiting points, there's uh, an infinite uh, radius circle known as the radical axis of the pencil. So if I make my lambda become very big, okay, I start getting closer and closer to an infinite radius uh, circle that approaches this ideal line here known as the radical axis. Okay, so let's bring uh, lambda down to a more normal thing. So here I'm sweeping the pencil, okay, and this dark black thing here. Now what's the subject of this video? I'm going to take this random blue triangle on the right, okay, and I'm going to invert its vertices with respect to this black, this black circle over here. So I'm going to get the, uh, the red triangle. So the vertices of this red triangle, which I'm calling the inversive triangle are inversions of the vertices of this blue triangle with respect to this black, the stick black circle here. Let's look at the construction line. So how do you invert a point, right, with respect to a circle? You actually draw a line to the center of the circle. So I'm going to take this point here that I wish to invert. I'm going to draw a radial line going to the center of the circle. And the radius, uh, the, the radial distance from the center to this red guy here is a reciprocal of the radial distance from this point to the blue circle, the blue uh, vertex over there. So I'm doing, I'm executing three inversions. Okay, so that those three inversions <coughs> yield the vertices of the red triangle, uh, which I'm calling the inversive triangle. And now I'm going to play the game of varying uh, this black circle, so sweeping the circles of this pencil, and look at uh, and and investigate what happens to a triangle center of this inversive family. So I'm showing here x1. x1 is the in-center of a triangle. And I can tell here that as I sweep my pencil, x1 is moving. Now, how precisely is this guy moving? Let's go ahead and draw its locus. So the locus of x1 is this curve here, which is not being drawn in its completeness. It's going to keep going, OK? But I can actually inquire as to whether this curve is a conic or not. So Let's go ahead and turn on the conic detector. And it's telling me, no, this locus here is not part of a conic. It's not part of a parabola, of a hyperbola, or an ellipse. Very well. Let's move on now to x2, x2 being the body center. What happens to the body center as I sweep uh, the pencil of circles? It's also moving along that red uh, curve, that arc of some sort of a curve. But the detector is telling me this thing is not a conic. Very well. Let's call it the circumcenter. Now, with the circumcenter, you get the first very cool uh, phenomenon. Uh, as I sweep, as I sweep the the pencil, the circumcenter of the inversive images sweeps an ellipse, which has been detected numerically here. It's being shown green. So there's an arc of an ellipse here. Okay, the center of this ellipse is on the radical axis of the pencil, so here's the center. And this thing is axis aligned, so this locus, this arc, is part of an ellipse which is axis aligned with um, the radical axis. And it's perpendicular to the line that joins the two limiting points. Moreover, uh, if you were to finish off this ellipse here and actually trace it, it's complete. 
uh, uh, locus or its complete border, you would notice that it passes through the fixed circumcenter of our reference blue triangle. Okay, so as I sweep this pencil, okay, I'm sweeping that red arc of an ellipse, and let's actually take out this construction of the of the inversion now that you guys understand what this is all about. So this arc belongs to this green ellipse that is going through that the x3 of my reference. Now let's do something very interesting now. I'm going to draw the mirror image of this pencil, which is part of the pencil as well. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm now drawing the mirror image of this pencil. And I can also do the same, play the same game with respect to the mirror. I can execute an inversion or perform an inversion with respect to the mirror uh, member of this pencil, which is also shown thick black here. So again, if I sweep my circles, okay, now I'm sweeping these two circles in parallel, I have two inversions. I have a first inversion of the blue with respect to this black circle on the left that gives me the, the red, and I have a second inversion, which is uh, the magenta polygon, whose vertices are the inversions of the blue vertices with respect to the sister or twin triangle on the right side of my uh, elliptic pencil. And it's elliptic because uh, the circles don't touch. No, no two circles, so, uh, twin circles in the circle intersect. There's another kind of a pencil where the circles intersect in two fixed points, and those are known as hyperbolic uh, pencils. But we're only looking at elliptic pencils now, or an, at an elliptic pencil. Okay. So the interesting uh, remark here is that the X3 of this magenta polygon, it's actually not appearing here on the screen, but it's, it was all the way up there. You can see it's over here because this inversive magenta is very obtuse, so its circumcenter is lying way out of the triangle over here. But the cool thing is, on this side, the X3 of this magenta, okay, this twin, this evil twin of the red, is sweeping the same ellipse. And it's actually going to go all the way through the top of the picture, then come back and uh, connect up with the red when uh, this black circle becomes pretty close to being the radical axis. And let me turn on this phone, Let's see if I can make this guy muted. Okay. So as my the radius of my circle uh, increases, and I apologize for the, the phone uh, ringing right now, it's going to be over in a second, but you can see here that X3 has gone all the way around, come back in, and it's over here trying to connect up with its twin brother. Now another really cool thing is happening. As the, the radius of these uh, uh, thick black circles here increases to infinity or tends to infinity, uh, the inversive image will tend to a reflection of the blue uh, reference. So uh, the inversion of a triangle with respect to an infinite radius circle is a reflection of blue with respect to the radical axis. So you can see here that both uh, red and magenta are approaching uh, the reflection of the blue. And I can actually exaggerate that by making this uh, gamma parameter, lambda parameter become even bigger. And let's take it to 100. So now you almost have a reflection. So what's happening here is that when you have a reflection, uh, the inversive images become, right, reflected images of the blue and their X3s are going to become reflected images of X3s, of the original X3. So this is a way for us to argue that this locus by symmetry is going to have to go through the X3 of the original family. Because it is a curve, it is a symmetric curve, right? That is going through the reflection of X3, so it must go through the original X3. Even though the X3 of the reds never quite make it, they never quite make it to go around and come back through here, we know that this is a symmetric, we're looking experimentally, this is a symmetric curve, so uh, it must pass through the original X3 by virtue of symmetry and the fact that um, the inversion with respect to the radical axis is a reflection. Okay, so X3 is presenting us with this very nice uh, phenomena. Right, we're getting this elliptic locus. Let's turn off the right side here so we can see the elliptic locus or the elliptic arc that is swept on this side by X3. And, and the, one of the endpoints of this arc 
is L1 over here. The other endpoint is going to be the reflection of X3. If I were to continue to uh, compute, I actually placed a, a, a limit here, like a, a upper limit on uh, the, the points or the samples that I use to compute the locus of X3 on the side. Uh, but you can see here that yeah, my limit point is approximately this circle here is the last circle shown. But if I kept going, I would keep going. And when this guy was uh, tending to infinity, this lambda parameter, this X3 would actually tend to the reflection of X3 about the radical axis. And the other end point is L1. Likewise, for the guy on the right side, one of my end points is second limiting point. And then this guy on this side here, the inversions, the inversive image, they do go all the way around. And they come back and they finish again at the uh, reflection of X3. Okay, so you actually never touch this bottom area here, this sort of small elliptic arc, as far as I understand. You're not going to sweep this. Uh, uh, and you basically have an arc of an ellipse that is uh, swept on the right side. It goes from L2 all the way to the reflection. And then on the left side from L1 all the way to the reflection. So there's a little green arc here that we can see that is not going to be covered. But that's okay. All right. So let's look at another uh, point, that another triangle center. And let's go back here to five, some, you know, intermediate circle. Now let's take, for example, now X4. What does X4 do? X4 is not presenting itself as a conic. Is this uh, hooked curve here? And it probably has additional structure that we should want to strut uh, to study let's see what the other side is doing it's not it's doing something uh, ugly okay so let's actually skip that over and let's go to x5 x5 is not doing a conic it's doing something that looks like it has a self intersection and there could be additional structure here uh, let's skip that now let's go to the side median point x6 x6 also brings us to a conic lock locus uh, let's look at the left side of this conic lock, locus first. Uh, it starts at L1, and it's going to move along an arc of this green ellipse, and this green ellipse is also centered on the radical axis, and axis aligned with the radical axis, and it's perpendicular. Now, very interestingly, now I'm starting on L1, and I'm going to sweep this red area here, and I'm going to end at the reflection of X6 about the radical axis. And likewise, the left side is going to do the same, a similar thing. It's going to start on L2, and it's going to sweep and end at the reflection of X6 on the radical axis. Let's sweep these circles so we can examine that. So I'm increasing the radius of my so the two circles in the pencil, and I can see here the two inversive images moving along the same ellipse until they're going to approach, they're going to approach the reflected image of X6 about that radical axis. Okay, any other interesting uh, interesting low side? Let's go to X7, uh, the Jordan point. It's not doing a conic. Over here, I'm seeing that the detector is saying, okay, neither one of these branches is conic. How about the Nagel point? Not a conic. Notice that these low side, they're not even symmetric, right? Uh, and this is because I, I picked uh, a random triangle. I don't have a mechanism now to change this triangle. But I could submit more, more pictures here where this triangle changes. But none of these phenomena uh, are related to the particular uh, triangle shape. Let's go back actually to the in-center because I have not shown you guys. The in-center, uh, so one question I have here is whether the locus of the in-center is symmetric about this axis here. And I'm just looking here by inspection whether this thing is symmetric. It doesn't look like it is, right? Um, at the same time, I want to say it is. But I cannot really make out whether if this curve were to be completed, we'd get something that is symmetric. Uh, not sure. Not sure. These guys would join up over here. And the question is, is this curve symmetric on both sides? It's an interesting question. We could investigate that. But it's definitely not a conic. So we had stopped at uh, the Nagel point, not symmetric. The missing point, not symmetric. Uh, the, the speaker center, not symmetric. Uh, 11th is a Feuerbach point, uh, not symmetric. So X12, X13, and I don't believe X1 is going to be symmetric. Okay, I'm starting to uh, see that none of these, uh, none of these other points is. Uh, X14, 
And then we get to the next interesting accident, X15. So the locus of X15, uh, the first isodynamic point, is a perfect circle, and the circle is centered on our radical axis. So the loci of X15 are two circular arcs, okay, from L2 all the way to the reflection of X15 on the side, and L1 all the way to the reflection of X15 on the side. So that's a circle. And a similar thing happens to X16, another circle, covering the bottom. So you see, go back to 15. I'm above L1, L2. When I go to 16, I'm below L1 and 2. And they're both circles of the same radius, very harmonious. And then the next thing that we're going to get is another point, and all these points are on the Brocard axis. They're special points. We think that there's a rule. There's a rule related to harmonic conjugation. Uh, but these are all points that are involved in harmonic conjugation with one another. Uh, here's X61. X61 is also a conic, very similar to the conic that we had obtained with X6. It's not the same, but it's a conic that is above L1 and L2 and is centered on the radical axis. How about X62? Also a conic, and is this one closer to the one we got from with X? No, so this one seems to be smaller. So the X62 conic is slightly smaller. How about 371? If I can get to that. Here's 371, another conic, distinct. Here's another 372, yet another conic. These are all distinct conics, right? Uh, 1151. 1151 is pretty close to a circle, but it is not a circle. You can see here that its uh, axis ratio is 0.9697. How about 1152? Uh, somehow I'm detecting this as being perhaps a hyperbola, right? Yeah, this looks like... This might be a hyperbola. Yeah, and this is sort of the one of the um, asymptotes of the hyperbola. I wonder if this hyperbola uh, of 1152 is an actual uh, right hyperbola, rectangular hyperbola or not. Then we have uh, 1151 was actually an ellipse. 1152 is a hyperbola. 3311 is an ellipse, and 3312 is an ellipse. How did we find these? Guys, did we find this in an exploratory manner? I was actually going through uh, ETC, and I was looking at properties, uh, chiefly of X61 and X62, and noticed that these points were related via harmonic conjugation to 371 and 372, which were, uh, in their turn, related via harmonic conjugation to the other points on this list here. I haven't done a very uh, formal exploration of what the rule is here, but I think it's related to being on the Brocard axis, and uh, uh, which is the line that connects um, X15 and X16 of a triangle. And so they're all, all these points lie on the Brocard axis of this triangle, this blue triangle here. Uh, I've checked that. But uh, being on the Brocard axis is just necessary. It's not sufficient, right? And then there's another rule that uh, we're still looking for that is going to explain why certain points on the Brocard axis First of all, we need to prove that it's necessary that it's on the Brocard axis, and then we need to prove why these particular points on the Brocard axis have the property of uh, having their loci over this uh, elliptic pencil of circles being a conic. Okay? So this is pretty much it. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.